So thank you everyone for joining us this morning on our webinar, uh, Brine to Refine, an overview of equipment and processes used in direct lithium extraction. Um, we're gonna do an overview of the different types of equipment, processes, and best practices for use in direct lithium extraction, so a DLE, from raw brine conditioning to final refined lithium product. The intent of the webinar is to provide the attendee with an overview and description of the many different types of equipment and processes available for use in pre-DLE, DLE, and post-DLE treatment trains in which to help and aid and support clients in the development of their DLE processes. We would like to start with two um, simple polls. So let me get those going if you guys wouldn't mind sharing with us. So here's the first one. How many of you are developing DLE processes? I'll give everyone a minute to answer. Okay, 50-50. And then the second poll that we would like to launch today is um, where are you in this process? So are you in the evaluation stage, the piloting stage, or the demonstrating phase? Oh, demonstration phase, sorry. I will let people, I'll give everyone a minute to answer that. Perfect, thank you so much for your answers. And now I would like to introduce Grant Lee, our Vice President of Engineering Solutions, who will be hosting today's webinar. Grant, I'm passing you the, the baton. Thank you, thank you, Kayla, I appreciate that. And uh, very very interesting with the polls, um, but but not um, shocking as, you know, DLE is a new technology and uh, everyone continues to progress. Uh, and examining these uh, different technologies, but where a lot of you are, as we just saw in the polling, is that 50% are still in the evaluation. Others a little bit further along on the developing curve on, on the piloting. And I'm going to say a couple of outliers I, I, I bet are there are on the demonstration, which have, have surpassed the piloting. But regardless, what I want to do today was to provide a very, um, I'm going to say, high level overview um, because in doing, um, working with engaging clients uh, globally, and we have over 50 designs that we were working on, it seems the common denominator, we have the same questions coming to coming again. Whereas we do this on a regular basis, um, clients that are just stepping into this, this is their first time. So hopefully the intent here is to provide you some insight, um, some guidance, and which may allow you to um, maybe speed up your DLE processes or or maybe ask different questions uh, with respect to qualifying different technologies. So to 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 start, um, I'll pull up the presentation here. Oh, where am I here? I think I know this by now. There we are. So so Brian to refine it's equipment and processes used in in DLE. Uh, and really, when you were talking about DLE, it, it is a there's a pre-DLE, there's a DLE and post-DLE. And DLE, of course, is an acronym for direct lithium extraction. So I just thought first thing is to get everyone on the same page is like, what is DLE? I mean, we we throw this, this is a new terminology and we throw it around a, a, a lot. And there's some misnomers about it when we say, oh, it's a DLE. Well, is it a DLE treatment process or is it DLE material? So just on clarification, I mean, a DLE treatment process is a complete treatment train. And it's the approach where we are taking lithium, uh, directly extracting that, and we're producing uh, a, a product. That is a treatment train or, or a DLE treatment process. DLE, um, direct lithium extraction portion, is the portion that uses ion exchange or absorption materials. Um, some people, yes, you can use extraction. Um, I don't encounter that a lot. And this, um, webinar is specifically geared towards absorption and ex ion exchange materials, um, but it is, it's essentially reaching into the bulk fluid and pulling out or absorbing uh, the, the lithium from that. So incredible you know, uh, advantages over, uh, I'm going to say open pit or hard rock mining on, on lithium, 
Whereas um, kind of the irony is, is that, well, your mind is this eight, 18 inch borehole, which I'm pumping fluid out versus this huge open pit. Um, so when we take a look at the DLE, it, I mean, why it's getting such traction in the market space, uh, because there's so many uh, opportunities and advantages here. And one is on the environmental side. Um, getting environmental uh, approval or permitting is um, typically easier, or we're going to say an easier process, I uh, shouldn't say easy, or um, an easier process or path to follow than, um, uh, than hard rock or open. Uh, the next is, um, you know, when we take a look at uh, direct lithium extraction, this is the materials. Um, really what we're trying to do is we're either trying to, um, it's a process of either um, exchange or absorb uh, lithium, um, which is a separation process, or we're trying to concentrate. So really it's it's a separation and concentration process. That's essentially what, what DLE is a 50,000 foot view. Um, on the separation process, that comes a little bit more, um, uh, a little bit more challenging. Uh, as you're aware, is that a brine? Um, I mean, jokingly say that 75% of the periodic table sits within that brine. So there are challenges to it. And when you start concentrating up all those ions, we extract water and concentrate up. Um, some of those uh, challenges or um, issues can be become exponential. So. Essentially, with, with DLE, it is, again, it's the um, concentration and separation of ions. But what is the, 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 the nature or the, um, the substances in there and the concentrations of are going to dictate? Uh, this just quickly represents that, you know, there are some easier ways of separating ions apart from each other, such as if I, if I had, um, you know, lithium, uh, an iron or lithium or uh, aluminum, they're easy to separate. However, in this category, from separating them from each other, a little bit harder to do. So depending on the, the concentration and the chemical properties, that's going to dictate kind of the unit processes that we're going to take a look at on the separation purification. So stepping back, when we take a look at lithium extraction, um, really two uh, two broad categories here is uh, ideally a lean feed. Um, I'm going to say like unconventional brines, which would be, let's say, geothermal or um, or petrolithium that could any range in lithium from 75, let's say, to 200 ppm versus a solar in South America, which would be 2000, 3000 ppm. So DLE is a great technology uh, or process when you have, you know, a, a low lithium uh, source and we're looking to extract lithium, concentrate and produce a product, um, I'm going to say with unconventional uh, res um, uh, resources or, or reserves. So that is one aspect to it and, and a great component, whereas again, the DLE, direct lithium extraction, is a selective transport process, and that could be either through an absorption material uh, or ion exchange. On the post-DLE side, we kind of get uh, take a look at similar materials, um, but the functionality is a little bit different. Rather than doing direct lithium extraction, now we're looking at polishing. And the polishing is that rather than absorbing on the DLE, whether absorbing the lithium onto the materials, now what I'm looking to do is remove the contaminants out of the lithium um, solution. It could be lithium chloride and, and so on. So those are the two um, terminologies. We typically use a lean feed or a rich feed. Typically, this is you know the DLE eluate or, or pre-DLE, and this is post-DLE uh, after concentration. So that being said, um, I've got a lithium brine, and I want to produce a finished product. How do I get there? Um, you know, so the first thing we want to uh, take a look at, I'll, I'll state the obvious, is that we want to know what my starting point is, uh, what the brine, um, uh, uh, basically mass balance and, and characterization is, and then what's my final product? Is it, is it lithium chloride? Is it lithium hydroxide? Is it lithium bicarbonate? Um, because that's going to dictate part of those unit processes. So what I've done is I've broken these up into a little bit um, I'm going to say an easier way of um, uh, managing or messaging this is uh, pre-DLE is everything before 
the, the DLE process. DLE is the actual process itself, would be absorption and, and deabsorption. And then post DLE is the concentration, um, I'm going to say conditioning, concentration, polishing, and conversion of, of, of the product. Those are kind of the three main um, um, areas or categories. So in designing the system, you know, the first thing is that you step back and take a very um, broad, uh, broad scope picture of what I'm trying to accomplish here. And essentially the DLE is kind of three categories, the three aspects to it of the design is, well, I'm, I want to extract lithium from brine. I want to concentrate the lithium. I want to, and then reject all the impurities. So I have a very high quality product. Those are the very, uh, I apologize for very crude, but those are the main objectives within the DLE process. So when we take a look at that, great. I, I kind of know what the DLE categories are. I know what my objectives are um, and away you go. I can just pull a DLE uh, process off the shelf and throw it in, into my brine, um, in, into, my, into my DLE process. Well, you know that's, that's not correct. Um, is that every brine is unique. It's like a fingerprint. And because every brine is unique, every DLE process is unique. Via V, the, the challenges uh, on uh, equipment selection, design, process recovery, system, um, system efficiencies, all those things are representative um, and, and, and indicative of what you're starting with. So depending on where the brine's pulling up, they're all different. They have different uh, uh, different contaminants, different concentration levels, and that's because of the geological formations that they, they sit in. So different impurities, different concentration means that I have to use different unit processes in which to address, remove, separate, purify, concentrate um, these the, the, the brine into the finished product that I want. So here's just a couple of examples. Um, um, that Aramit, and this is publicly available information. Um, as I said, we work with multiple uh, clients. We have NDAs, but this is very generic information, and this is readily available off the, the, the internet. So with, with Aramit, this is actually an application um, in South America and Chile, where you can see that uh, they're using absorption material. Uh, I, it's, uh, I believe they're using um, water to elute uh, the lithium off. It comes off, it goes into a nanofiltration, uh, nanofiltration is great uh, when I have contaminants such as the divalence. Um, and the reason I, I'm going to use this is that reverse osmosis, I've got to make sure that the, the purity of the feed going to RO um, is, is, is quite high because I, I'm going to be concentrating this as high as possible, at, at typically a high pressure. So any contaminants such as calcium, magnesium, um, um, uh, sulfates will have devastating effects on the performance uh, uh, of this system, which may um, induce higher capex or higher opex. And really, it's the opex we're taking a look at, is we really want to make sure that once the system is designed, it's 24-7, 365. Yes, there's some shutdowns. Let's say utilization of 90% 90 uh, or 85%, but we want the system to be continuous with, without any um, um, uh, uninterrupt or unscheduled uh, outages. So the nanofiltration is great um, to, to reject divalence, as I said, calcium, magnesium, uh, sulfates, it comes into the RO. This is a conventional, uh, comes into a thermal evaporator, um, typically a bulk boiler. We're going to distill water off. It's going to concentrate, right? We, we I want to extract, I, I want to condition, I want to concentrate, and then finally I want to convert. So now in this particular one, I believe it's uh, sodium, um, uh, sodium bicarbonate, sorry, sodium carbonate, um, I'm going to use that to convert the lithium chloride over to lithium carbonate. Um, depending, again, on the product, it could be that maybe I don't even want to convert it. Maybe I just want to produce a lithium chloride because the um, the person that I'm going to, or sorry, the company I'm going to be selling uh, the lithium uh, to in lithium chloride, they're going to do the conversion on, on site. So depending on the end product and 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 what your um, uh, who your client is, is that maybe you don't have to go um, include this step because I can, they're going to do the conversion. But if you have to do the conversion, then there's, um, we'll, we'll talk about the different con uh, conversion mechanisms. Um, myself, um, I do my designs based off of simplicity. Um, if I don't need to do that, 
um, I'm going to not do the conversion. It just simplifies my process and simplifies the, 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 the operations. Another one, just a couple of quick, um, because again, I want to point out is that every brine's different. Um, so therefore your DLE processes are different, um, different constraints, different energy operations, uh, different economics will, will, will dictate this. Uh, this one is uh, standard lithium is in Arkansas. Uh, this is they're actually using a brine. I'm sorry, a, a bromide uh, which has some lithium in it. Um, if, so you're familiar with this. It comes through pH adjust a little bit different rather than, you know, in this particular one where you had a column where the resin was uh, absorption media was sitting in a column. Um, what this is, is a reaction vessel, whereas the media uh, and the brines are intimately mixed together. Um, in, a, in a, a fluidized uh, bed and then transported over to a washing station and then stripped. So a little bit of a different process. Um, this is still using absorption material, but again, um, this allows in their particular process, um, which is the Lister um, extraction process, um, they feel more intimate and, and better, re better recoveries to these. So that's another example of the stripping. Uh, E3 lithium, um, using a little Duke um, uh, reservoir, um, same thing. So here's a pretreatment. They're using not absorption, but ion exchange. Um, they've uh, modified theirs proprietary, so it's a little bit more selective uh, for the lithium extraction, which increases the um, overall uh, system recovery or plant recovery of the lithium. Uh, polishing, um, chemicals here, but it could be electrochemical, uh, electrodialysis, um, this particular, and we'll, we'll touch on this later in the presentation, is that um, because I'm converting over this particular, if I'm using electrolysis, that usually dictates that I'm going to convert that to lithium hydroxide because electrolysis, when I take H2O and I hit it with a DC current, I can split and I can have a hydroxide radical, which is going to complex. And there's my, uh, sort of like my free chemistries uh, or free chemical in which to convert and then off to a battery grade. So that's it. The other component I want to take a look at, so you have different uh, contaminations. The other thing to take in consideration when you're doing your design is, you know, what is the source? Well, there's great opportunities in some instances in geographic locations is that, well, maybe I can use alternative energy sources uh, in order to drive my processes. Uh, and that's a great thing to put into your um, economic um, uh, assessment evaluation through your PEAs is that I have free energy, uh, that means, and, and if it's an alternative for sustainable energy, it means that I'm also going to have a CO2 reduction. Um, so um, a CO2 equivalent reductions and emission reductions, that can translate over to um, carbon credits. So the less um, CO2 that I have, the more uh, carbon credits that I can have. Now, in some areas, that might be substantial. Uh, such as the UK, where carbon credits are $85 per, per metric ton, um, or maybe not significant if you're producing in China, which is around 3 to $4 per metric ton. So things to consider. Uh, in this, in the geothermal, is that this is because I'm pumping this up, water's coming up, I'm sorry, brine's coming up at a very high temp. Well, I can use that through um, an indirect, I use a heat exchanger, and now I've got this, this thermal energy that I can use within my processes. If I'm going to use thermal energy, then that's going to dictate that I'm going to, if, to, to take advantage of that, I'm going to have to use processes that are thermally driven uh, and not electrically driven. Um, so again, uh, depending on the source, what I'm trying to achieve, that's also going to um, take you through your process. Uh, flow diagrams of kind of what I'm going to select and what I'm not going to select. But I thought I'd just point that out. The other one is geothermal is solar thermal, that if I'm in an area that has a good um, 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 uh, irradiation um, areas such as South America or places close to the border, however, you know, it can be, um, doesn't necessarily have to be close to the border. It can actually be in Canada where it's cold. I can still use um, solar thermal to, to generate because of the different technologies that have evolved. Anyways, so geothermal and solar thermal is great opportunities in, in which to reduce your overall um, uh, energy requirements and using a, uh, a, an alternative sustainable energy, um, as you're probably already, you know, as you're aware, is that you still got to go through your, your environmental permitting. 
And uh, as I previously said, that if I had an open pit versus, um, you know, lithium from brine, the environmental permitting process is going to be easier with this. And it's going to be even easier um, if I have other um, advantages um, or um, benefits which are going to help the environment. Uh, such as the uh, my water footprint. In some areas that you're going to be in water stressed um, or, or drought areas, so water is going to be a critical component. Um, you you not you can't pull the water out uh, unless uh, or there's going to be a restriction on the amount of water you can have. So that'll be a bottleneck. So the key design, um, typically the majority of lithium or DLE uh, processes focus on the water footprint. I want to maximize uh, my water extraction, my water recovery uh, for, for reuse, and I don't want to waste anything. So if that's an objective, which is typically is, there's going to be certain technologies that we're going to select or, or, or be weighted more than other technologies. Um, water footprint, you know, I'm going to say that is um, water footprint CO2 or carbon footprint. Uh, or more and more being evaluated um, or, or being um, viewed as critical for value add within larger companies. But also, uh, when you take a look at the financial industry, when we talk about uh, uh, ESG, environmental social governance, that environmental um, side uh, can be greatly affected uh, or influenced by the water footprint or carbon footprint. But so. Water footprint, just to summarize, is, is we want to maximize our, our water recovery for, for reuse. That's going to help in our process. Energy requirements. I want to make sure that it's minimum energy requirements. If I can use geothermal or alternative, I'm going to do that. If not, then I want to use, I want to have my optimum process, um, you know, maximum product, maximum quality, but at the minimum energy requirements, which is typically my, my specific energy consumption. So I want to make sure that's minimized. And all those unit processes, the more unit processes you put in, the more energy you're going to require. The carbon footprint, quite simply, is that that's really related to the, the energy requirements. I mean, um, um, has direct influenced uh, by the energy requirements. Uh, depends on how you do your carbon footprint evaluation, um, such as your, your supply chain, um, 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 vehicles used in, in transportation. But if we focus just on the energy requirements, that's where the majority of the carbon is going to be come from. So uh, that could be associated for electrical or maybe I'm burning natural gas. So that's a critical component we, we, we take a look at. So getting up to the to the to the key ones, the number ones and number twos, DLE lithium extraction efficiency. Well, everyone talks about DLE and the one critical component you take a look at is you know the material is great, but how efficient is it at extracting? So if I load the material up, am I going to get 60% extraction efficiency? Am I going to get 95% extraction efficiency? And as you can guess, it's that the higher the extraction efficiency I have, the better the production uh, or the, the, the more lithium I'm going to be able to produce in, in a shorter period of time. So I want to maximize the, the extraction, I mean, the, the how quickly I can load I want to maximize the efficiency in which the lithium is being directly extracted from the brine. And that is going to have a direct correlation on my um, the economics of, of, of the overall plant. But I really want to focus just on the, the direct lithium extraction when you're working with your DLE providers. That's the number one question is that, well, what's the lithium extraction efficiency of that particular material, whether absorption or ion exchange? Next is the lithium recovery. That means that not just the DLE, but every unit process. Maybe I lose some lithium across a membrane. Maybe you know I do a, a physical chemistry and it gets part of it gets precipitated out. So I know what I'm starting with. I need to know what I'm finishing with. And the difference is, is what's the overall um, system recovery efficiency. And that takes account into all the unit processes. So these are kind of when you take a look at the economics of the plant, these are the two main ones uh, that you, you take a look at because lithium is the, you know, is your product um, and has the value and I don't want to lose any. So these are the two, I'm going to say, uh, metrics or measurements uh, that I constantly take a look at. If I do this, does that improve the overall um, system uh, recovery? If I tweak, you know, maybe the pH or something, maybe that 
helps with my extraction efficiency. And we'll dig into, into the lithium a little bit more. So let's take a look at the overall uh, DLE process. And I've, um, I've said I kind of broke it into pre-DLE, DLE, and post-DLE. I've broken it down into some you know, more unit processes within those three main categories. Uh, and first is on the pretreatment side. Uh, we'll take a look at each of these is, is total suspended solid removals. So this is what I'm starting with. This is my uh, my process um, uh, flow sheet uh, my, or my treatment train. And each one of these, um, this may represent, you know, um, multiple. So TSS removal, um, it could be a pressure vessel, uh, multimedia, or it could be um, staged filtration. So even though this is uh, represented by a single block, it could be multiple um, um, process steps or a series of process steps with, within that um, uh, area. Next, contaminant removal. So this is really uh, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to precondition before it gets into my, my DLE material. I don't want to have any solids or contaminants flowing into that because that's going to affect um, you know, short-term and long-term performance. Um, and significantly, if I don't remove this, then my OPEX is going to go up. Um, and we're going to take a look at each one of these unit processes and purity removal. Um, it's quite simply as when I've, I've loaded up my lithium uh, DLE material, I, I elute the lithium. It typically comes off. Lithium, there's a couple of other contaminants, but it's a low, uh, low in concentration. Those contaminants I want to remove because those contaminants may have a negative effect on the downstream unit processes. And again, depending on the, the, the equipment I select, these impurities may have a minor effect or it could have a major effect on, on the performance of them. So again, it's critical that we, we understand what we're starting with and what we're trying to finish with. Um, this is on the concentration. Uh, lots of information we'll go through on that. Um, and then polishing is essentially the contaminant removal. Um, typical uh, different types of um, technology we'll take a look at. Conversion, as I said, you may or may not have this step. Um, it could be just straight lithium chloride, and that's the finished product, or the conversion might be lithium hydroxide. Um, as I said, you know, you could use electrodialysis using hydroxide, or I'm going to react this with, with uh, sodium, by, um, sodium carbonate. So that is, just so you know, that is a very, very high level view uh, of, of the different unit processes. And the intent is, is to get you familiar. These are the types of unit processes that you need to start looking, that you look at. And then each one of these unit processes, um, we kind of looked at individually, but then we have to take a look at them collectively. As you're aware, the, the the system. So, this is kind of what the uh, I take a look at in working with clients is kind of the, the decision tree or the stage of the DLE process development. So, as I said, is I'm going to start um, originally is what's my input, and the first thing um, you you need to do once you've I, I, I've I've drilled my uh, reservoir, I've done my um, I've got my um, exploration. Uh, borehole done, and now I'm going to pump up some fluid. So the first thing we want to do, of course, assay and, and determine how much lithium's in there. Um, but what I'm focused on is that, okay, we need to then send that brine in for a complete uh, analysis and workup. So I need to know the metals, the ion species. I need to know the particle distribution. I need to know, uh, you know, what is the intended, um, what is the mass flow that you're intending on, on the DLE, the pH, the density. Complete characterization. Uh, and, uh, and basically a mass balance uh, of that. And that is so critical uh, to, to, to get right. Um, I will say a lot of the times I, I get some really rudimentary stuff, which I can work with no problem on the modeling, but the more information I have, the less error or the less assumptions I need to make in, in, in my modeling, and that's the same for yourselves. Um, there are certain things you do this enough, you can kind of, okay, I, I'll make this assumption, but if if this is, if you're doing DLE for the first time, then it's critical that uh, you understand and have a really good understanding because all this, you've heard, you know, um, garbage in, garbage out, that if I start with errors here, 
it's going to cascade all the way through uh, to, to the final stage. So next is that once I have my input, I do my desktop modeling. I mean, this is uh, quite simply, it's my, I'm going to do a check uh, of mass balance that the ions are going to balance. I'm going to do, um, to take a look at, you know, what are the, what's the energy requirement for a specific unit you know, process. Uh, and from that modeling, then I'm going to do projected results. Okay, based off of my input from my brine, based off these unit process and, and operating specifications, then here's what my projections are going to be. Um, typically, the, 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 the modeling isn't that diff difficult to do because it's a very high, high level. Um, and essentially, what I want to bring it down to is get a good understanding with an estimated capex, opex, and what my product quality is going to be if, if, if I'm able to do it at that particular unit process. What does that all mean? For my desktop modeling, I mean, it's uh, quick. I've got my, my input, I do my modeling, and it's a go, no go. So what I mean by this is I'm taking a look at a specific technology or unit process, uh, and from my very back of a napkin modeling is I'm going to make a decision whether that technology is, is good, um, a go or, or a no go. Uh, and if it's a go, then the next thing I want to do is, is benchtop testing, which is a physical testing. This is mathematical, theoretical. And um, as I'm sure all of you are aware, working in this field is that there can be a huge difference between a, um, uh, between a brine analysis and desktop modeling versus a benchtop physical testing of that sample, meaning that sometimes you don't capture everything um, within the characterization uh, of the brine, but it turns up here, um, sometimes minor, sometimes significant. So, but the key is that the validation of the desktop modeling has to be done with physical testing. So the benchtop, as you're aware. Um, typically small volumes. I don't need a lot uh, to go go through. Um, it'll give me good data on my projected results, uh, good information on the capex opex, my my product quality, and I can take all that data now and I can go back and take a look at my modeling and say, okay, the correlation um, uh, of the uh, of the two, how is that, and do I need to make adjustment on my modeling? So this this data or sorry, this data feeds into that refinement. So if that makes all sense, um, and typically benchtop testing, I'm, I'm taking a look at different technologies. I haven't made a selection yet. I mean, we took a look at what am I trying to achieve, um, whether it's DLE, whether it's concentration, or whether it's it's uh, ion separation, or purification. Uh, I'm going to be doing my desktop modeling. Could be you're doing this in-house, or I'm outsourcing this to to, to a vendor. Majority of vendors um, should have um, benchtop testing facilities um, and systems in place. Uh, if not, there are other methods, but you need to do the physical testing. Um, so off to the, this is a go, off to the process piloting. So this was a small volume, now I'm doing larger volumes. So as you're aware, when we in the, in the field, that the more volumes I can pass through a unit processes over a greater period of time, um, the better the accuracy, there may be more data points that I can extrapolate and, and determine, you know, through hysteresis, is that what is the, the actual um, uh, efficiencies and, and operating parameters and, and turndown ratios of that, that particular uh, process or technology. So that's critical. The other aspect to the piloting is that once I've kind of validated and selected these technologies, well, now I'm going to start gluing those pieces together. And I want to start seeing maybe not the complete treatment train, but I want to see how those unit processes function and perform together. Um, as I said, it's that if there's an error here or there's an upset, it could cascade down. The other component is that each unit process can influence the other one. So if I kind of optimize this, then the performance here increases. So I want to take a look at not in a vacuum, but on a macro level of how these are going to perform. So I may take, you know, um, requests from a client, you know, um, provide me the DLE Eluit. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, some, some filtering or, or some um, uh, conditioning. So it could be nano filtration or something along those lines. I'm going to go through and then maybe successive uh, concentrating, and then maybe to um, um, uh, contaminant removal. 
but I want to do that those in unit process to see how those all those function together. And by doing that, I can um, take a look at my, my flow sheet optimization, as I said, the different unit processes. Uh, I can start taking a look at and doing extrapolations on my production and throughput based off of this complete um, a treatment train or, or com component percentage of the treatment train. Uh, and then, as you said, the important is that my water footprint, uh, my, my energy, um, um, specific energy um, um, requirements, and then also I can extrapolate what my, what my CO2 is if that is, um, if you're able to, 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 to work with the client and so on. So that is my my processing. So I've taken a bunch of these technologies. I've vetted them. Some passed, some didn't pass. I've now down to you know a select technologies. I'm going to pilot those and see how those perform. And then I'm going to take the best ones and I'm going to move that, take that, and glue the best technologies together into my demonstration plan. And the demonstration plan is different, whereas these are bulk samples or, or grab samples. This is an on-site testing of a live stream. Um, typically, there's not a lot of variations, but I want to hook this up uh, and I want to run the system on a continuous 24-7, um, you know, for, you know, a couple of months at a time to see the overall um, process performance. As you're aware, the more data points I have, the better the accuracies and the modeling is going to be. So that's why it's key. Uh, when you get to a demonstration is that I'm going to have on-site equipment uh, and I'm going to run that the selected technologies in a complete treatment train process in which I'm going to produce not the, you know, my uh, commercial um, production quantity, but I'm going to produce a demonstration quantity, um, you know, a couple of, couple of pounds or, or, or a thousand pounds. Uh, you know, anywhere from on average, what I see is about 35 to 100 cubic meters a day on, on a demonstration plan. So this is key. It takes this is um, a lot of work to get to this point. Um, and people deal, uh, um, developing and designing DLE processes, you know, my, I tip my hat to you because there is an incredible decision process. Um, and qualification and understanding and vetting of all these different technologies. As we said, every brine is different. Every DLE process is different. Um, you can kind of, you know, take a look at what other people are doing, but this is a unique process. So it takes a lot of effort and a lot of um, time in order to get to this point. But if I can get to this point and I can prove it, you know, break open the champagne because the next step is full scale. I've proved it out. It's been accepted and now it's full scale commercialization. Now we're off to scoping feasibility, um, uh, design evaluation completion, selection of the e um, um, EPC or uh, engineer procurement construction permitting and lots and lots to do. So this process um, is in a couple of months it's typically a couple of years to 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 get to this. So um, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. Um, to date, right now, there's really how many DLE uh, processes are are running. There's really two, which would be uh, Livent and uh, and Sun Resin. Um, probably by next year, you're going to see more online. By two years, you're going to see a lot more coming online. So just to break it out. Uh, we've gone through, here's the, the uh, unit processes, you know, a high level, pre-DLE, DLE, post-DLE, post -DLE, broken that out into the different unit processes that you need to uh, consider and evaluate when, when you're designing it. And then we when you're doing your evaluation, this is typically the, the process flow. Again, this is just one interpretation that uh, that I go through, but you probably have others. But the, but the, the concept is typically the same, go, no, go. Um, selection, deselection, and finally getting to, to a demonstration plan. So taking a look at the, at the modeling, um, you know, the first thing, as I said, you know, garbage in, garbage out. So you have to have accurate modeling. This is just um, a, a screenshot. This is, you know, one of the, a, a small portion of the modeling that we do. But what I just want to point out is that it's critical to know, and this is just an example. This is not uh, anyone's brine. Anything but an example is that just to point out that I'm um, when I take a look at and I run my analysis, the one thing I want to take a look at is what's in there to, to begin with. And then 
uh, we talked about is that we're going to be concentrating. Um, I mean, we're going to be extracting water. We're going to be concentrating that. And as I said, as you as you concentrate, as you remove water, you concentrate. Not only do you increase the lithium content, but you also increase uh, all the other uh, concentration of uh, the uh, components within that uh, at, at the same level. So can be good, can be bad. But if I have certain components in there, such as calcium, which is, of course, very, very common, um, it's it's insignificant on its own, but if there's other components it can complex with, well, that becomes a challenge. Depending on the concentration, depending on the other complexes I have, uh, again, this is a very um, rudimentary. Uh, calculating solubilities and co-precipitations um, is, is, is very challenging. I don't know any computer in the entire world that, that can do a level of, you know, a periodic, you know, having a brine sample with 75% of the periodic table in, be able to calculate um, you know to to decimal accuracy so this is a very high level uh, and I start off with just taking a look at solubility indexes if that's helpful to anyone um, but what I'm looking at is really when I concentrate what do I need to deal with and and what are do I have to consider solids management um, if the solids are too high um, certain technologies are more robust than others um, meaning the, the different operating parameters, but um, regardless if it's too high and it exceeds all operating parameters, then I need to do something with that. So in this particular case, um, you know, um, this is um, an example of an, uh, a DLE eluate. Um, we've extracted water from it. It's 7.7 .7 concentration factor. You can see whatever this is. I mean, there's 7.7, .7, and these are the things that may not be an issue. Um, but these are the things we're going to consider. And in this particular program, you know, how am I going to get, you know, uh, uh, adjust this? Sometimes it's not a mechanical fix. Um, sometimes all I need to do to to um, alleviate this is just do a pH adjustment, um, or maybe I'm going to add an anti-scale in a sequestering um, um, uh, chemistry, uh, or on a mechanical side, maybe I'll do nanofiltration, or I can do uh, ion exchange. I can use um, um, softening zeolite uh, resins in which to remove the calcium magnesium. Um, as I said originally, there is a lot of options and a lot of technologies available to you. Um, and as you start off with, you know, here's one, I've got 10 different options. And then as you cascade to each one, you can quickly see that you have a million decisions to make in front of you. Um, so it's it's helpful to have that game plan and roadmap. Um, so I, I, I say that, you know, when you start off with your design, make sure you've got a good model um, because you're going to be modeling, modeling, modeling. Um, and that helps you to tweak and optimize your, your, your flow sheet. Um, if you don't have a modeling program, please feel free to give me a shout. More than happy to, to run analysis and provide you with that information. We do that for free. Um, as long as you give me uh, the, the, the information I need, I can just plug it in and, and away you go. So we've done, you know, just on the mathematical modeling, the other component is that uh, I would suggest to do is start, start breaking, okay, once you start selecting, here's kind of the, the, the DLE or the process or unit process that I'm considering, start doing a, a mass flow um, uh, diagram. Doesn't have to be complex, but a visual identification which you can readily or easily communicate with each other um, um, and, and allows you to optimize and try different things. So this is just a very simple um, uh, process where we're taking the, the, the brines up. This is a reinjection side. Um, always make sure that there's a good distance between the two. Um, sorry. Um, we're going to pump up, go through. This is my filtration. Can be some other unit processes here, depending on what we're doing. Goes through my my DLE, and then from there, again, um, depending on what my my RO and what my um, and this is an, an FO, what those different unit processes are going to kick out, what what the different values are. Um, if you don't have that, please give me a shout. I can I can share with you um, uh, information I have. Um, uh, the more knowledge we get out into the into the DLE market space, look, the the better is for everyone. Um, I was speaking with someone last week and kind of jokingly say that I don't know why we work in a vacuum. Um, currently, right now, lithium production is about 100,000 metric tons. We By 2030, we have to get up to 
like 2.6, maybe 3 million metric tons by 2030, depending on whether you're doing routers or um, whatever financial you're looking at, meaning that there is such a demand in there. No one's competing against anyone for years and years and years. So um, to me, I freely share information, um, nothing, um, no proprietary client information, but any information that I can readily share with you, I will. Uh, it just makes the marketplace better and will allow us to meet that supply and demand curve a lot faster. So taking a look at, let's start off with the, with the initial unit processes. Um, I apologize, this might be rudimentary for some, but the first thing is I say, you know, you want to do some roughing is that if I'm pumping up from, from a borehole, depending on how I drilled, whether it's a diamond or maybe it was a, a, a chipping, that I probably going to have a lot of contaminants in there um, or, or residual colloidal materials and so on, depending on what my um, my, my supply. So the first thing I want to do is um, I'm going to pass it through um, my preferences as I'll put it through a pressurized uh, multimedia filter. Uh, and this has the why I like multimedia. Everyone has, I'll point out, everyone has different um, um, ideas of, of how to do this and, and, and um, opinions. Mine is that I do this because with the pressure, um, I have a smaller footprint rather than do, tr trying to do gravity. Um, there's other technologies that you can use out there. Um, I'm not here to promote any specific technology or company, uh, but you can do something like um, uh, like an active flow uh, ballast, um, if, if that's a particular um, a media, if you're familiar with that, knocking it down. Anything I, I can use to knock down those physical particles, colloidal particles um, or large particles, this will typically take you down to about five microns. I can then pass that through, um, depending on what the downstream process is, I can then cascade that through uh, other unit processes. And, and, and again, now that I'm feeding into my DLE, the DLE manufacturer is now going to dictate to you, okay, this is what I need. I can't have particles bigger than this or these type of contaminants. So the DLE, uh, understanding the parameters and the requirements there, it's going to kind of dictate your your pre daily um, preconditioning prior to to the DLE column or, or DLE material. So quite simple: microfiltration, ultrafiltration, nanofiltration, uh, or, or RO. Typically, this is what I see: is is um, microfiltration, ultrafiltration. Just so you know, is um, in the industry, microfiltration, ultrafiltration, capital costs are typically the same. The difference is, is going to be in your OPEX cost, is that this is a tighter pour, which means that you're going to have a higher differential pressure. It means that the energy requirements are going to be higher here. You're going to get a better product. But if I can get away with, oops, sorry, if I can get away with uh, microfiltration, perfect, because my OPEX is going to be lower. But again, it all depends on what I'm trying to remove. Um, typically, I don't I don't see on the pre getting down to the nano filtration unless there's something in there, uh, a divalence that I have to remove. But again, working with the DLE provider, that's going to um, uh, uh, indicate to you. Getting down to the actual DLE materials, um, as I said, I only focus on um, ion exchange or absorption materials. Uh, ion exchange is typically, uh, we can say, I mean, uh, not promoting, I mean, Dow or du DuPont. I mean, that's one component. It, it's that you have a, a um, um, an ionic site or a radical site in which it's going to exchange. What you see now is that, um, I'm going to say these proprietaries, they modify that site. So it's a lot, uh, it's a lot more um, lithium selective, which means if it's more lithium selective, it means that the extraction efficiency goes up. And you can see different materials, whether ion exchange or absorption, uh, are now posting, you know, um, uh, extraction efficiencies like 90, 95%. I mean, 95% is incredible. Um, so, but that's the type of efficiencies that you, you could be looking for or targeting. Uh, the absorption materials, they're basically, to, to me, there's three basic materials. It's either aluminum, manganese, or titanium-based. Uh, they are um, supplied by different suppliers. This is just a few. There's others. Um, there's also um, uh, 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 ge geolith, geotherm. 
there's um, multiple suppliers you can take a look at. I, I will say when you work with your DLE provider that I would make this suggestion too, which I found very um, uh, beneficial, is that get them to one, yep, yeah, test the brine, um, do the loading, do the elution. Once they're able to prove that out and they have their operating parameters, uh, I would put to you is that uh, the next is, is really taking the eluate from that, conditioning it and concentrating it. One thing that I do is working with the DLE providers is that once they have formalized what the process and operating parameters are, they send me a cartridge of their materials. I take it into my lab and now what I can do is that I've got my um, my brine, I can I can go through that uh, working with the DLE provider. I can create my Eluit and then I can try different unit processes. Why is that important? Well, a lot of the time is shipping samples back and forth between vendors um, can add, you know, half a year to a year onto your DLE process, um, particularly if you're shipping, um, I'm going to say across the pond or, or overseas. So having the ability once that DLE is all set up in the processes is having um, the people looking at the condition in the concentrating work with the DLE providers uh, in which to create that next process. So I've got my DLE, my conditioning, and my concentrating. As I said, if I can put all those unit processes together, I get better accuracy in my predictions and modeling. And I can knock that off much, much quicker if I work collaboratively and not in, in a vacuum. Sorry if I, I belabor that. Um, but it can really cut down on, on time and, and um, uh, really increase the DLE um, uh, development. So when I'm taking a look at DLE, we said, I mean, there's different suppliers, different materials. Um, really what you're taking a look at, these are the questions you should be asking the DLE providers. And because DLE is upstream, these are critical to, to, to get right. Um, the other unit processes are a little bit more robust, but this has direct uh, correlations uh, to what your um, extraction efficiency and what this is also going to um, affect uh, impact what the overall system recovery is going to be. So the absorption capacity is, is great. The selectivity, uh, meaning you know how well uh, am I going to get this? Separation efficiencies. There's different ions. I mean, we're, we're taking lithium out, but what if I have a really high sodium content? What if I have a really high uh, chloride content or boron content? Are those ions going to negatively impact the selectivity or the absorption capacity of those materials. So that's critical. Um, so understanding that, just so you know, you can tune the brine. So maybe I don't concentrate up the brine coming into the DLE. Maybe I detune that so the uh, concentration is less because this is going to improve uh, the efficiency of the DLE. Again, every unit process is kind of impacts the other unit processes. So you have to constantly look at the individual, then, but look at a macro level uh, of the overall uh, process flow diagram. Um, thermal stability, extraction times. I mean, this the the other one to me is the the integrity um, of the um, the physical integrity of of, of the uh, of the resin. Is that if I hit it with with temperatures over time, is it going to crack? Am I going to get fines? I mean, that is a critical uh, aspect. So these are. These questions, if you can get the, uh, if you provide these to your DLE providers, this is the information that you want to have. So getting back to, to the DLE, DLE Eluit conditioning concentrating. Um, so this is the post DLE, I'm, I'm sorry, um, this is the pre, this is our DLE. So I've got my, uh, I've loaded up, my, the lithium has been loaded up onto the resin. I've now um, um, eluded that off. It could be through, depending whether it's ion exchange or absorption material, it could be like a dilute hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Uh, if it's absorption, it could be a dilute lithium chloride. It could be um, it could be water. Again, depends on the material here. Will dictate what am I going to? Do, what's the material I'm going to use to desorb the um, lithium and create my eluate? That eluate comes off. Typically, the, the lithium concentration um, is not uh, overly high. It's still good, but it's not to the level we want, uh, so it's diluted. So the first thing we want to do is, is, is we want to concentrate this up, but if I concentrate it, maybe there's contaminants in there that i got to get removed, uh, removed first. So 
taking a look at a, 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 um, a, an exploded view, and again, this is just uh, one example of working with a client is uh, taking a look at, sorry, taking a look at um, using RO and, and FO. RO is typically, you're going to find that that's going to, I'm going to say 90% of the time is going to be in your DLE flow sheet. It is a, um, the gold standard uh, technology, in my opinion, is um, it's well understood. Um, the supply chain to get materials and parts is is, is there. Um, it's a mature technology, so you put that into it, and it's a low energy. That being said, um, the process, as we, it all depends on where I'm starting on, and I say the total dissolved solids. So I elute that off, and I take a look at well, what are my total dissolved solids I'm starting with? Uh, not only lithium, but overall my ionic balance, and that's going to dictate the type of RO I'm going to have, um, my starting point. And then what I'm going to do, whatever my starting point is, is that I'm going to progressively increase the pressure uh, on the RO to uh, ensure maximum water recovery and maximum concentration coming out the back end. Now, Technology has has advanced. There, are, there. Now you can see this is maybe not common to some of you. Ultra high uh, pressure RO allows us to develop pressures up to you know 1600, 1700 psi. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, is that as TDS increases, the osmotic pressure increases, which means that my pump pressure and the energy requirement goes up accordingly. So, in these particular instances, I wouldn't drop down a single RO system. What I do is do uh, interstage boosting that I would have, let's say, a brackish. I'd have a booster pump here to um, pump up the, the, the pressure, uh, maybe you know, 500, 800 PSI, uh, a higher pressure, let's say 1,200 PSI, and then another interstage uh, booster pump uh, pumping it up to 1,200 PSI. That's going to get me to you know, a very high concentration. Um, as they get up really, really high pressures, I mean, it becomes the higher the pressure, the more sensitive. So maybe I put in a nanofiltration here. Uh, I'm going to take that through FO. Maybe some of you don't know what forward osmosis is. Um, this is osmotically, this is pressure driven. This is osmotically driven. But I can take the concentrate off my high pressure, ultra high pressure, run it through my, my forward osmosis, and now I'm at not 12%. Uh, I've extracted water and now I'm at 240,000, 260,000 ppm, and then off to my next unit process, which is polishing. So that's a, a, a critical component. This is probably the most common component that you're going to see uh, within your flow sheet. Um, rather than FO, that some people, um, conventional technology would be a thermal evaporator. Um, why I put FO in, one is just for um, a disclosure, I mean, we manufacture an FO, so it's going to sound biased. Um, so I would um, I would ask do investigation, do your research. Um, but a typical FO is um, you know anywhere from 50, 60 percent less energy. But also uh, FO can be thermally driven, so we we can tap into alternative sustainable energies such as geothermal and um, solar thermal to drive the process, which means that. Essentially, I'll give you an example of a project from two weeks ago um, at about 3,000 cubic meters a day. Um, the energy requirements to process was less than seven cubic meters, um, um, uh, sorry, seven um, uh, kilowatts per cubic meter in order to process because we could tap into the, the sustainable energies. So not every application is that unique but this one was the stars lined up and that allowed us to really get down the energy costs and, and the co2 and maximize uh, water recovery so um just quickly what is forward osmosis in case you i'm not going to belabor this and 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 do a dissertation on it forward osmosis whereas you understand what um ro is whereas it's pressure driven the difference with fo and why it is i'm going to say more robust is that um, what we use is a draw solution and rather than pressurizing and driving the bulk fluid towards the active membrane layer where uh, where i have a concentration polarization layer which i'm going to compress and compact which is a legacy issue with ro i can drive solids because of that in into the membrane and have irreversible flux loss 
difference is that FO, I'm physically attracting water across the semipermeable membrane. I'm not driving it, I'm not pushing it, I'm attracting water through a semipermeable membrane. So it means that it's still a physical mechanical separation process. It's still going to foul, but if I have foulants, what happens is that they're going to be loosely dispersed. Um, and what I mean by that is here's a, a pressure driven system. Um, very, I apologize, crude um, um, uh, diagrams here or graphics, but uh, here is my concentration polarization. Uh, it's being compressed and pushed into the active layer. Whereas this, you can see again, still fouling, but the, the, the matrix of fouling is very dispersed, which means that it's easier to clean. And a lot of the times uh, I can just, using a high velocity water flush, um, because of the, I mean, a cross flow, that the turbulence uh, creates the scouring effect, which will shear off uh, any contaminants against that. You're still gonna use um, uh, chemical cleaning, but I don't have to chemical clean every day and it's going to be you, be used a lot less chemical than this. Uh, and if we're looking at the environmental aspect, less chemistry I use, um, I mean, less the, uh, the lower the OPEX, but the better the environmental component. Um, oh, I'm going to have to speed up here. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit over my time. I apologize. There are, when you take a look at um, the evolving technologies, uh, you know, conventional RO versus newer technologies, which is high recovery RO. And here is just a, a an example of high recovery. Uh, again, these are pressure driven devices. Um, so there's some limitations to how much pressure you can push and what you can produce. Typically, you're going to do something, a roughing filter, um, kind of a, a, a more of a polishing filter, maybe nanofiltration and, and off. As I, Because I'm going to operate at higher pressures, they're more sensitive. I have to have the proper treatment train. These are just different. Um, these are high recovery ROs. They, they operate um, differently, pros and cons to each one. Um, there's a, a good report by Blue Tech Research. Take a look at that and it kind of give you a little bit better background on, on these, but this is just an overview of that. Um, I'm sorry, I'm going to speed up just a little bit. Um, uh, lithium chloride polishing, as we said originally, we said, you know, when I take a look at my materials um, for um, DLE, it's essential I'm going to reach in, I'm going to um, absorb and attract the lithium on polishing, it, it's the contaminants now that I want to remove. So it's, um, in this particular case, uh, it could be ion exchange, uh, it could be physical chemistry, precipitation, so a phys chem, could be electrochemical, uh, lithium capture using uh, ion separation, such as uh, electrodeionization. Um, and if you're not familiar with electrodeionization, um, I think that's a, it's a good technology for polishing. Not, um, I'm not saying that's the only one, but um, I, I like it um, because I'm not using chemicals. Uh, it does use a little bit of power. Um, there are limitations to it, but essentially uh, it allows me to purify my stream. Uh, and in some cases is that I can also use this uh, to, because it is a um, uh, electrodialysis, I can create a free uh, hydroxide radical to do my conversion if I'm going from lithium chloride to lithium hydroxide. This is kind of the same technology I used in my, my conversion. Um, uh, so the lithium chloride conversion, as I said, I'm going to use this, I'm going to produce my, my free um, uh, radicals, my hydroxides, and that's my conversion. Getting down to the to the final leg here, um, hopefully you're still online, is taking a look at the energy requirements. Uh, that's always a critical, depending on where you are. Um, if it's if it's cheap electricity, uh, that's great. Um, but if electricity is really high, uh, natural gas is low, or maybe there's alternative. I'm going to constantly take take a look at uh, different scenarios. Uh, FO. This is just one component. This is on the concentrating side. Uh, I break it up into three: uh, heating, cooling. Uh, and an auxiliary. Um, and then I base that off of, the key is that, um, take a look at the energy requirement is in the product that whether, you know, you're doing thermal evaporation or other technologies, what's the energy requirement to the produced water? I mean, that is what you're trying to get at, this recovered water. Um, some, sometimes people, to make the numbers look better, they'll take, okay, the the energy requirement divided by 
by the feed. To me, that's not how you do it. Make sure that you know you're you're comparing apples to apples. Do what your water rec your energy recovery should be associated to what your water uh, your energy is associated to your water recovery. Um, lastly, just um, solar thermal energy. Uh, we talked about geothermal, solar thermal energy. There's a bunch of rules of thumbs. I just uh, I'll point that out. We don't manufacture, uh, we don't produce it, but the technology has evolved so well that uh, I would strongly take a look at solar um, and where you are. Um, you don't have to be the by the equator anymore because the technology has improved so much. I, maybe I don't have a huge irradiance, but I can still produce a thermal, thermal energy that can knock my, my pricing down. And I bring this up is that maybe 20, 30 years ago, the CapEx cost was quite high. CapEx has significantly dropped. So if I do, rather than doing natural gas or electricity, and I choose to go so, uh, solar thermal, it's not just kind of kicking the can down the road, meaning that, great, I've got this free energy, but I've got this huge CapEx cost. Typically, what I see is um, a lot of the times the payback period can be very short, <laughs> in some cases a half a year to, to three years. So something to seriously to consider um, as an alternative sustainable energy. Um, CO2, I won't belabor that, is that whenever you can get your energy reduction down, so this is the thermal evaporator, uh, that if I go to different technologies to use this different energy, I can get my CO2 down. Um, it's important too is that if I want to be green, uh, have the greenest lithium, I want to get my CO2 emissions down. The other component is there's an opportunity that um, depending on where you are, the, the carbon credits that you can pick up may be substantial enough, maybe you know hundreds of thousands of dollars in savings that I then I can apply that annual savings that I can apply to um, reduce my overall uh, annual operating cost, or may um, cause you to make different decisions uh, based off of that. So uh, I'm not going to belabor that. So when you take a look at, you've done your processes, and now you get to start getting into the nuances of, of what you can do. Uh, and there's always nuances to different designs and, uh, and, and different opportunities. This particular one uh, I point out is for absorption, and I'm using like a, a, um, a dilute lithium chloride or I, I use water. Uh, as I said, some clients are going absolutely have to reuse every drop of water. So in this particular case, when we go through, as you're aware, I've loaded up the absorption material, the columns. So there's still, because I've been running raw brine through there, the lithium's been extracted, it's loaded. I still have a lot of brine in there. So I go through a displacement cycle, which is essentially a plug flow that I'm going to use the recovered water. I'm going to push the brine and everything out through, through the bottom uh, laterals uh, and displace that and get this all prepared to, to elute. Well, that water, the depleted brine or the displacement water, well, I can take that, I can concentrate it, I can capture the lithium, I can return the lithium back into the raw brine and I can recover that water or I can pump it back down um, to, to my injection well. If, if that is the case, then if I recover more lithium, that means my overall system recovery goes up. So if I can increase my system recovery by one or two percent, that's pretty significant uh, at the at the uh, at the end of the year with res uh, respect uh, with respect to what my overall production capacity is. Um, another opportunity that you may have, or well, maybe um, I don't want to reuse the water. Well, with FO, uh, as we said, FO works on osmotic gradient. That as long as the draw solution is higher in TDS then the feed or process solution, water will spontaneously and automatically move across the membrane. So what does that mean? Well, we talked about the draw solution, higher TDS. Doesn't have to be our draw solution. What if we use the depleted brine in order to drive that process? I don't need to capture the water, so I can use the depleted brine on the one side, concentrate up the, the lithium and push it through. So. Lots of opportunities in which to optimize your, 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 your processes. Um, just to cover off ourselves, um, you know, this is what I look at. Um, here's my extraction of water. Our process is a little bit different. Uh, I can go into it. We're, we're running out of time. We'll go into it another time. But the uniqueness is that 
I extract pure water across, it dilutes, so I have a salt solution. I don't want salt solution. Uh, with our technology, we have a salt, we, we hit it with a low grade heat. It causes a, um, a conversion, um, a separation from, goes from a liquid to a gas. The gas leaves solution, pure water is left behind. Water is ejected, the gas is collected, concentrated and, and re reprocessed. Um, so this becomes a closed loop process. So this is what we, we uh, our live pro um, uh, forward osmosis system that we use in the, in the DLE, which allows us to operate up to 240, 260 ppm TDS, maximize lithium concentration, minimize CO2. Um, as I said, if I could use solar thermal, it's I can reduce uh, CO2 by 90% and I can maximize water recovery up to 90. Um, depends on where I am in the process. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for uh, for those of you holding on. Uh, I am I'm way over my, my time limit. I tried to talk as fast as possible. Uh, I hope it didn't feel like drinking from a fire hose, but the intent here was to provide you with an overall um, or an arcing view of here's the different um, unit process to consider. Here is kind of the um, decision processes and, and, and qualification of technologies. And here's a sampling of the different technologies that you may want to consider. So thank you very much for your time. Um, I really appreciate it. I really hope this was, was helpful to you. As I said, um, any information I can provide you, I feel is, is helpful and will accelerate the development of DLE. Please feel free to reach out to me. I can do modeling or whatever. Um, but my intent is to, to help and support. So thank you. Um, I appreciate this. And uh, I'll back to you, Kayla. Thank you, Grant. Do we have time for a quick Q&A session? Sure. OK, perfect. So I have opened up the Q&A um, section. If anyone has any questions, um, now would be a great time to start the discussion and you can input them. I would like to start with um, a simple question. So what is a typical DLE system recovery rate? Uh, excellent question. So DLE um, uh, varies. So um, depending on the type of materials, there are you know good and bad, but you should be targeting right now. There's materials out there uh, that have been developed that are more selective than previous technology. So you should be targeting uh, I'm going to say on the low side, 85%, but really on the high side, around 95%. So that's the range you should be. But on average, I, I would I would really say that the DLE provider should have around a 90% um, uh, extraction efficiency on the DLE materials. Thank you, Grant. And then I also have another question. Um, in your opinion, what are the main challenges in selecting equipment and designing a DLE process? Uh, a, a, a loaded question, um, so I'll give you a, a, um, a quick synopsis. What what I found um, is, I mentioned before, is is when you develop your DLE, um, as you get through the selection of different technologies, um, you should be developing a team, a collaborative team, meaning that each unit process can can affect and impact the next unit processes, and sometimes. A unit process, which they may see as a negative, is a positive downstream at, at, at a post process, meaning, let's say, using uh, temperature, meaning that, oh, the, the feed's coming in, it's too hot, um, or I, I'm generating heat, I got to get rid of that, so I, I've got to uh, off sync that. Well, wait a minute, it could be a, a process downstream going, well, I can use that heat. So look, I will absorb all that heat to, to, to act as your cooling, and then the, the, the energy that I have is going to make my process more efficient. So what I mean, don't work in a vacuum. Um, get people to sign NDAs and start working collectively together, because I can assure you is that a lot of the times is that because people know their technologies very, very well, there may be opportunities in which to optimize the, the, the process um, that others can see that others others can't see. So um, by building a team, you you bring together years and years of, of knowledge and experience that that uh, that is going to help you leverage just leverage that work collectively. That that's that's what I'm going to say in a nutshell. Doesn't cost you anything, but it's going to speed up 
uh, your your DLE development, and it's going to going to produce the 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 optimum or the most efficient DLE process for you. Fantastic, thank you, Grant. And we do have another question: What are the temperature and flow rate limitations of most DLE methods associated with 165 Celsius, I believe, with and geothermal brines? Um, so uh, high temp, I mean, it's uh, it's you're probably looking at, I mean, different DLEs. I think the 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 highest I've seen is around 40 degrees C. Um, that's what I've seen. Uh, now, a lot of these are, are polymer base. Um, so um, polymer base, that means that they have, um, if I can be glass transition temperatures, meaning when you start heating them up, they start changing the physical properties. So you cannot exceed certain temps. So the highest I've seen is around 40 degrees. Um, typical is around 20, 25 to, to 40 um, uh, operation, depending on the different um, 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 Again, the brines, the contaminants, and so on, uh, because the concentrations contaminants in there um, can also affect what your operating temperature is going to be, meaning that, hey, I can run at 40. Oh, but wait a minute. You've got that contaminant, that con concentration. You're going to have to dial back the, the, the temperature. So um, in a nutshell, 25 to 40 degrees, but you got to work with your DLE provider specifically what am I starting with and what the DLE material is going to see? So that that's that's what I've seen. Now, to get the temperatures down, if you're very high, a geothermal uh, and coming in, um, typically you're going to put a heat exchanger uh, into that. Could be a, uh, a tube and shell or a plate and frame. Um, all depends on what you're trying to get at. But you can then reduce that temp. But remember, it's a heat exchanger. I've captured that heat so I can use it um, it, that energy in a unit process downstream. So you're not going to lose any um, energy. It's a little bit heat exchange su surfaces, but not a lot, let's say 85, 90% um, thermal efficiencies. But I'm going to be able to use that, that temperature later on. So, um, or I can heat, um, drop the temperature down, go through the DLE, then through the heat exchanger, bring, bring it back up. So I'd have a, a, a thermal storage area that I would then um, think of a thermal battery, um, store it, and then bring it back up. So lots of different configurations that you can use, um, and you can lots of ways to manipulate and, and move energy around your, um, your, your treatment train. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, everyone who has joined us today for the webinar, and thank you, Grant, for sharing this with us. I will note that the webinar in the upcoming weeks will be available on our Ford Water Technologies Corporation website. Um, so you can always refer back to it there. And if there are any more questions that come in, um, Grant will contact you directly in the next couple weeks or something. Great. Thank you again. Thank, thank you very much. And everyone have yourself a great day. Take care.